And rightly, rightly so. She's carried the heart of, of Christ and this church for decades and grateful, grateful for her. Okay, well, another group of people that uh, I'm going to be inviting up. This is the missions team that just returned a couple weeks ago uh, from Kenya. We're going to give a brief report as to what you empowered and enabled us to do uh, while we were gone. So this is Jim, who's in charge of our missions team, and we have a native Kenyan here with us in Wayne Pollard, so he looks fantastic. <laughs> okay, take it away. All right, come on down for the rest of the team. Pastor Key is still coming in. So after months of planning praying, fundraising, and getting ready, we all loaded into a, a van at the Nairobi airport and headed two hours south of Nairobi to Kijani Farm. Uh, Kijani Farm is a ministry of Brian and Heather Delameter, who are members of our church and have been sent out by, uh, by this church. And uh, we went there to encourage Brian and Heather and Charlie, their five-year-old, whom I affectionately named Hurricane Charlie because of her exuberant energy from the time she woke up to the time she went to bed. And we went there to, like I said, to encourage them. And uh, we did that by being involved in pastor training, uh, by being involved in the three preschools that they have started, and also by being involved in community outreach. So I want to give the mic over to Pastor Dave, first of all, to talk about pastor training. Actually, I'll skip you and go to the next person because you got your own mic. <laughs> I do have my own mic. I can repeat this. Uh, okay, so again, thank you for your support. Thank you for the encouragement. And uh, it really was an incredible time. So we did spend uh, really two afternoons with area pastors, and then we spent two more days with a staff. And with the pastors, it was us three going back to back to back to back, uh, talking about preaching. That was a subject that had, they had most interest in. And so we talked to them about the fundamentals of preaching, looked at a couple passages, encouraged them in many ways. And uh, it was remarkable, the questions that were asked were, were fantastic questions and the camaraderie. And these guys came in by motorcycle, and most of them came in by foot, just walking from the countryside in the drought. They were committed to their community. They're committed to Christ. They're serving him to the best of their abilities where they are. And so we asked them what some of their needs were, and they said they needed training, and they needed resources. We're talking financial resources. And so there's a drought in the area. Most of the men are out um, with their cows and goats and sheep. And the ladies and children are around. And these guys have stayed to faithfully serve Christ in that community. So it was an inspiration to us. We're grateful to deliver this material, the training that we've seen to them, and we talked more about what we can do in the future. Uh, with the staff, there's a number of staff serving there at Kajani Farms, and uh, those staff, we were asked to do a series of uh, really character qualities, and so we looked at the life of Joseph and various things from his life that could be implemented in their life as well. Encourage them, uh, challenge them, present the gospel to them so they think most of them know the Lord but weren't sure, and great response from those folks. So it was delights to have an opportunity to give to them what the Lord has given to us and continue to pray and think about those pastors, those, minds, those guys whose faces are in my face and looking forward to what the Lord will partner with us to do with them in the future. All right. Now we're gonna, I'm going to give them phone, the microphone to Holly, who's going to talk about our ministry among the preschools. Yes, have you ever played Duck, Duck, Goose with over 100 children? <laughs> that was our day. You can see the picture of Jennifer. Um, so currently, Kajani Farm has three preschools. One is on site on their property, and two are off site. So we spent a day visiting. Um, it was different than anything I'd experienced with you know, looking at preschools from the dirt floor to um, small children walking home by themselves um, after preschool was over. But we went and visited, and then we um, had, on Friday, we had a field day where they all came. Some but came in a wagon that was pulled by a motorcycle. Some walked, and we spent the day playing games, and then we, we colored we read books, we each kind of took a group, 
Um, but there's great opportunity here. There's great opportunity here for these preschools to see these children grow. Um, one of the things that, if nothing else, it's a way for them to learn and also get fed twice a day. So it's a great ministry that is going to continue to grow. I'm excited to um, see what happens, see what happens in the future with that. So I'll pass this over to Jennifer. I have to use my notes. <laughs> so, um, so two things that we are able to do on our trip were home visits and attending the women's Bible study. Um, for the home visits, we divided into two teams, so we were able to visit more homes, or they call them BOMAs in Kenya. Um, Holly and I were lucky enough to have transportation to each BOMA, and while the men trekked it on foot, I think they covered about, what, five to seven miles of walking that day? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, on our home visits, uh, we were invited inside their homes to meet and pray with the women. I'm sorry. It was such a humbling experience as I sat there in a dark room made of dirt floors and walls and little children running around, no bigger than my living room. Um, they had a little pot burning in the middle with a fire to keep them warm and to cook their, their food. Um, everyone was so welcoming, and um, all the families were very open to pray with us. Um, they all seemed to have the same prayer requests for the drought to end and for them to be able to afford school fees so the kids could go to school. Um, another opportunity we had was to attend the women's Bible study. We were able, able to join about 15 or so women one afternoon as Heather spoke on Abraham and Isaac. The women were very in tune and listened as she told the story. She even did a quiz on what they had learned in the past, and I think they all got the answers right for that one. And then after the study, we were able to join them in worship. It was an unforgettable experience. And even though we didn't speak or sing the same language, it was such a neat no experience knowing that we were worshiping the same God together. Um, they danced and sang songs for us, and then we were able to sing He Has Made Me Glad for them. And our dancing skills were less than desirable, but we hung in there. So, <laughs> so and personally, I am very thankful for the unexpected friendships that were made and for the time I was able to spend on Kanjani Farm. Please continue to keep the Delamitos in your prayers. The work they are doing for the Messiah is truly making a difference, and I am honored that God allowed me to be a small part of that. So that was 19,800 steps that day. And when Jennifer says food, she did a real good job of just uh, beans. That's it, beans. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm dressed in a uh, w what the older... Messiah men would have wore. Uh, now the younger guys, it's all blue jeans and T-shirts. Um, they're all they were wearing this, and what you couldn't see was what? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that was about, but any, anyway, they were carrying these machetes, and you couldn't see they were doing it. Um, so anyway, this is pretty sharp. It, and it wouldn't take too much effort to uh, to hone this down to where you could shave with it. Um, so a couple of people in the congregation asked me, well, what prompted me to go to Kenya? And it was kind of funny because I had a dream one night. Hmm. It's contagious. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was beekeeping in Africa. I don't know where this has come from, but it showed up. So anyway, next thing I know, I'm on my way to Africa with a whole bunch of beekeeping equipment. And um, so when we got there, I found that uh, the Kenyans were quite knowledgeable about bees. Their number one problem was they didn't have any money. Uh, we took a bunch of frames over. They cost like $3.50 a piece. If you're making $5 a day, you don't buy very many of these. Uh, so 
like I said, they were quite knowledgeable. They had made a little bitty box. They had made boxes and hung them in the trees with wire because we've all heard of honey badgers and they're over there. And they said they'll just tear them to tear them up. So, um, or t tear the hives up. So we took down, so, so we made some hives with movable frames like we have in America. And we took over a bunch of equipment uh, to show them how to smoke the bees. Over there, they just take off all their clothes down to their underwear. They get a, a wrap a piece of cloth around a branch and, and just kind of let some of the smoke drift into the hives. And then they take them down, they take off the top, and the, in, in a honeybee hive, the middle part is for the larva and, the, and just growing new honeybees. They store the honey on the outside. So these guys would take the outside uh, comb out for the honey. And of course, they're, uh, they were getting stung quite badly. And I said, well, in America, we don't get stung. So I we took a couple of bee so suits over with us. We took over a smoker. We took over a bunch of gloves. And they were quite amazed that here we were, we were goofing with these bees, and we weren't getting stung. So um, I don't know. I, I, you know, I learned quite a bit over there. And um, you know, I think the thing that maybe uh, I, I shared in the um, prayer room this morning and uh, just a second, I'll get regrouped here. I don't think we realize how much we've lost because of sin. And when we were over there, when you get up real early in the morning, there would be a couple of birds chirping. It would be completely quiet. This part of the world is just the way God created it. And the only, the only thing disrupting the silence was Jim and Pastor Key talking. <laughs> and <laughs> and you know, I really don't think we as Christians realized what Satan robbed us from because you know, we could still be living in the Garden of Eden today and thank you to God that he sent Jesus so that we, uh, our sins are forgiven and we're not all going to hell. Who's next? If you just put that knife away, I'll be good. No, okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to say that probably the highlight of the event for me was uh, when the one of the leaders, one of the Maasai leaders came to us and said, you know, your coming has been a real blessing to us, but th what you brought, the blessing that you brought is just another part of the blessing of Kijani Farms. And we, they, we, they recognize that because Kijani Farm is there, because the deli meters are there, that's why these blessings keep coming to southern Kenya. And so we had the privilege of representing you and going out because you gave, because you prayed, because you sent us, and we were able to represent you and be a part of what our missionaries, the deli meters, are doing in southern Kenya. So thank you. And maybe, maybe God is already stirring in your heart that, that you need to go next time. And we didn't mess it up, so they invited us to come back. But um, it might not be just the six of us. It might be some of you. So seek the Lord, pray, and ask him how he wants you to be involved. Thanks so much. God bless you. And may God get all the glory for what he has done. He has done great things. Amen. Amen. Okay. Thanks, guys. Good job. So the Delameters will be with us uh, in December. And uh, uh,
Heather's going to be bringing a message at some point, probably in January. Um, but this is the first time that they, so <laughs> Crosspoint has sent them, Temple Crosspoint has sent them, and this is the first time a team has gone to visit them. There's been individuals, and so it was a huge boost of encouragement for them. And these are our off-site staff. These are people that we uh, love. These are the people that we support. This is the people that we are involved with, and it's a good thing. Another way that you can reach the rest of the world is through prayer. Have we talked about prayer in here at all? Have we, have we done that? Okay. Well, tonight is our first all-church prayer meeting, and this is going to be the first Sunday evening of every month. So take your calendar, mark it down, 6 o'clock, the first Sunday of every month till around 7.15. And so let me tell you a little bit of what tonight is going to look like. You say, well, you know, I'm going to run out of things to pray about. You will not run out of things to pray about, okay? We are structuring this evening off of the Lord's prayer. And there's going to be 10-minute segments and a 5-minute segment, including worship. We'll be focusing in on various aspects. For instance... Hallowed be your name. We'll talk about giving glory for God, and we'll get together in smaller groups of about three to five people and pray. So I know some of you are flaming extroverts, and you say, yes, let's bring it on. Now, some of you are not as so, and you say, well, this is a little intimidating for me. You can pray in your heart. You can pray in a small group. <laughs> We're not going to say, here's a microphone, and it better be theologically correct, okay? Not at all, okay? We are expressing, well, hopefully it's theologically correct. <laughs> but we are going to be expressing our hearts to God. And I imagine that God will meet us when we pray. He'll meet us this evening. We'll see him working throughout the month. If we're going to be a church that makes a difference in the world, we must be praying, gathering together, asking God to glorify himself through us. Because when we work, we work, but when we pray, God works. Remember that? And we need God to be working. So please come out this evening. We will meet with God. We will pray with one another. We will worship together, and we'll look to conclude around uh, 7.15 or so. Near the end, we'll have a 10-minute segment where if the Lord has put a scripture verse an encouragement for the congregation on your heart, you'll be offered an opportunity <clears throat> to bring that forward. So that is happening tonight, 6 o'clock, 7.15. I really hope to see you here. Well, the last couple of weeks, I'm very grateful for uh, Pastor Lee and pa Pastor Michael and how they brought the word forward. They're powerful messages, um, beautiful messages. I am so grateful that we have so many people here in this congregation who can <laughs> preach, who can pray, who can pastor, who can communicate. And we are very much a blessed congregation. Now, I just want to tell us what's going to be happening in the future here. So I mapped out the messages to <laughs> Christmas. So today we're talking about to the end of the earth. Next week is a standalone message it's been gripped my heart is Elijah when he was under a broom tree, fe facing despondency and despair, discouragement, depression. What to do with those things. So next week we're going to look at that. The following week I'm going to be gone on a family trip to visit our daughter who's ministering in a church in California. Jim Black is going to be speaking that week. Then we're going to launch into, on August 28th, a 12-week sermon series based on upon a, a theological concept called apologetics, that is, defending the faith. I don't know about you, but I get tired of <clears throat> people who grow up in the faith, and through time they get confronted with questions that kind of jar them a little bit. As in, why would a good God send people to hell? Why is there so much Suffering Is the church anti-women? Is the church pro-slavery? Is the church homophobic? And all of these type of subjects. And so the goal is that we would be equipped to think through these things ourselves. And perhaps you have similar questions. That we would look at scripture. We would look at history. We would look at reasons, argumentation as to what Scripture really says about these subjects. And so we're going to be covering 12 different subjects, which would also include, aren't we better off without religion? Doesn't Christianity crush diversity? 
how can you say there's only one true faith? And there's a book that I read, and we're basing a lot of our material on this book that I have read, I have listened to, I have pointed people towards it, and I've purchased some of these books for people. It's called Confronting Christianity, 12 Hard Questions for the World's Largest Religion. The female author, her name is Rebecca McLaughlin, and she has done a fantastic job. It was the Christianity Today Apologetics Book of the Year in 2020. And these are the questions that, in particular, this generation is asking about Christianity. So I'm going to order some books. I'm going to have them here. I encourage you to read these books, and we're going to go through question by question, addressing these very difficult and important topics, again, that you your faith will be built up and you will be knowledgeable in talking with your grandchildren, talking with your children, talking with your co-workers about some of these questions that they may have as well. So I am excited to jump into that series. It's going to be our fall series going up to the Advent season and to, Christ, uh, to Christmas. And I want you to be engaging. You can go out and find this book, Confronting Christianity. I will encourage you to start reading it. We're going to look at that in about three weeks or so. Okay, today's message. So if I was going to ask you what was or what is the primary purpose for Jesus giving us the power of the Holy Spirit, how would you respond? Think about that. Why did Jesus give us the power of the Holy Spirit? This is the Holy Spirit coming upon us, different than the Holy Spirit working inside of us. How would you respond? Now, you may respond, well, he gave us those things because God wanted to restore the genuine order back in creation, and so therefore there's healing, or therefore there's signs and wonders, or therefore is God exploring himself, that is, uh, God showing himself off. That's what it is. You may say, well, it's because of the fruit of the Spirit, and God wanted to see these things grow in our life. Now, you may have answered or thought of along those ways, but Jesus himself gave us the answer to that question. The Gospels record the resurrection and what Jesus talked for around 40 days or so before he ascended to heaven and said, I'm going to be coming back. One of the last things he said, if not the last thing he said, was about the Holy Spirit. And so this is the first point for us, and this is why he said the Holy Spirit was given to us that to empower us to witness. First point, we are empowered, supernaturally empowered to witness. If, if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up to Acts chapter 1. And we're going to look at this passage, and then we're going to jump into Romans chapter 10 as our main text for this morning. So this is Acts 1. This is a continuation of the Gospels. We read about Jesus. We read about the disciples. We read about all of those things there in the Gospels. Now, the book of Acts then continues the story as to the Spirit's working and what happened next. And so as that book opens up, right in uh, uh, verse 6 of this first chapter, it says this. So when they had come together, this was the disciples with Christ, they, the disciples, asked Jesus, Lord, will you at this time, this is right before he ascended, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. Verse 8. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses, underline that, highlight it, in Jerusalem where they were gathered at that point, and in all Judea, which is the surrounding community, into Samaria, uh, Samaria, which was even beyond that, kind of a mixed race of people, and to the ends of the earth. Now to me, when you look at this, and some of you might be very familiar with this passage, the thing that stuck out to me this 
past week is that it's both comical and sad that the same question those disciples asked Jesus is the same question we continue to ask today. We want to know when he is coming back. I don't know how many times um, people have talked to me about this. Well, we're in the end times, and, you know, Putin's doing this, so Jesus is coming back soon. Or, oh, there's plagues that are happening here, or coronavirus, or AIDS thing, or blah, 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 blah. Jesus is coming back soon. Get ready. Jump up and down to practice, right? <laughs> we love this stuff. We buy books. Anyone here read the Left Behind series? You know you did. You know you did, Right? Right? Or the Bible Code, or 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. Wrong, right? I get requests. When are you going to teach the book of Revelation? (laughs) I don't really understand the book of Revelation that well. Okay? I know Jesus wins, right? I know I want to be with him. It's going to be bad if you're not with him, okay? Okay? I've studied it a lot. Maybe I'll talk about it. But people are like, when are you going to talk about that? Because I want to know the end. Right? Same question we're asking now is what they're asking. Right? The disciples are there. Jesus is resurrected. They heard about the kingdom. They're like, all right, Jesus. When are you going to make everything right? Right? They're asking that question. We're asking that same question. You know, Jesus, when are you coming back? Jesus, rescue me. Jesus, come back. I want to know this stuff. Right? We're asking the same question. And Jesus responded bluntly. (laughs) You're not going to know, Jack. Right? He says, God established it by his own authority. He doesn't need your input. You're not going to know. Right? We're just like little little um, uh, eight-year-old kids at Christmas time wanting to know when we can open our presents, right? And Jesus says, you're not going to know this. <laughs> and we still wonder about this. We become preoccupied about the end versus engaging the present, right? He says, you're not going to know, but let me tell you now what I'm going to do for you and what we, you, us, are asked to do. I'm going to give you power. This is supernatural empowerment to do what? Witness about what? Jesus. The gifts of the Spirit were given as evidence to the glory of the Christ. Okay? They were given to point to Jesus. And Jesus said, yes, I'm coming back. But until then, we have a responsibility. We have a job. We have an empowering to bring witness of testimony to Christ. This is our responsibility. Amen, Pastor. Amen. Okay? Not just... The Delamere is not just a missions team. This is everyone who calls Jesus Lord has been given the power of the Spirit to bear witness to Christ. That's the primary purpose the Holy Spirit was given. Yes, he transforms. Yes, he seals. Yes, he teaches. Yes, he convicts. Yes, he does these things. But the primary reason the Spirit was given to you, to us, is that we would bear witness to Christ. Here in Rockford, our Jerusalem, even way up to Winnebago and Roscoe and Rochelle and Byron, And to this country and to the ends of the earth. So we are engaged in a supernatural assignment given by Christ, delivered by God the Father to us. This is how God set it up. God communicates his attributes by what has been created. This is Romans chapter 1 verse 18. The invisible qualities that God has can be seen everywhere, 
by what he's created, from the intricacies of small hummingbirds and insects to vast mountains and oceans to the stars in the universe itself. These things proclaim and witness about God, but it is in a general way. Specifically, Jesus came to represent God. Specifically, God sent prophets and spokespeople. Specifically, there is the word, and specifically, God invites us to communicate his message to the world. You and I are plan A. There is not another plan. This is an awesome responsibility and an opportunity to communicate. And so we go to places like Kenya and to other places that are even harder to reach to give an opportunity for people to know this Christ specifically. And it is important, important, so much so that God endows us with his presence to bear witness. And this just isn't in these places. It's in the cubicle next to you, right? It's in the neighbor behind you that plays the loud music. It's to them as well. Okay? This is a great responsibility. So we have to stop wondering about when he will come back and start witnessing until he comes back. Thank you. You guys are doing so good, right? This is interactive. Stop wondering about when he's going to come back. Right? We get so tied up about that, that's all we think about, and we lose the neighbor next door. Stop wondering about that and start witnessing until he comes back. The gospel is important. The truth is that we carry the good news of the gospel. This is how God has set it up. This is his design. And we have the responsibility to communicate these things. Second main point, we carry the good news of the gospel. So first, we are empowered to witness. Second, we carry the good news of the gospel. Now, take your Bible, go over to Romans chapter 10. Romans is perhaps my favorite book in all of the Bible because it lists out God and his working throughout history. And at this point, Paul then talks about the power of the gospel and its essence. And again, many of us have this passage memorized. Here's what it says, Romans chapter 10, starting with verse 9. If you confess with your mouth, okay, this is important Information. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, circle that, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified. Set right in God's sight. And with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, Everyone, underline highlights, Everyone who believes in Him, who is Christ, Will not be put to shame in the final judgment. For there is no distinction between Jew and non-Jew. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's good news, right? The best news ever. And it is for 
all people everywhere. To have eternal life does not require certain education. To have eternal life does not require certain um, a certain family pedigree. To have eternal life doesn't mean that you only get in because you live in a certain zip code. This is good news that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now this is calling on the name of the Lord. And it has two very important parts. And I want you to understand this for yourself I want you to understand this for your community and for your children. There is an inward possession, okay? And then there's an outward confession. You'll see it right here. An inward possession, believing that Jesus is Lord, that happens in your heart, that you are justified. And then there is a confessing, an outward confession, a demonstration that he is Lord. Now, we believe in our hearts that God raised Jesus from the dead. We are justified. That may, is made right with God. This is belief in Jesus. You are saved by what Jesus has done and belief in him. There is no other way to God but through Jesus. Now, the implications of that are huge in our um, modern society wants to say that there are many ways to God. That Muslims are praying to the same God as Christians. It's not true, by the way. But we like to believe that all roads lead to, lead to God. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but through Him. There is an exclusivity to what He has done. We need to remember this. And so people who have eternal life, they believe in Jesus, who he was, that he is God's one and only son, what he did as he lived a perfect life and died in our place, and what the Father did by raising Jesus from the dead, which is granting eternal life. This is what we are to possess and believe in our hearts. It is through Jesus we're made right with God. And this is the inward work of belief. Most people in America will say that they're Christians. I think the number is around 80 or so percent that say they're Christians. Why? Well, because they live in America. Does living in America make you a Christian? I'm glad you know that answer, right? <laughs> Does memorizing parts of the Bible make you a Christian? No, the devil did that. He's not going to be in heaven. Does going to church make you a Christian? No. What makes you a Christian? Believing in your heart. Who Jesus is, what he's done, what God has done through him. It's an inward possession. I believe it is beyond knowing it is the 18-inch drop that puts it in our heart that says, I believe this to be true. A lot of people know about Jesus. Right? Not everyone believes in Jesus. So there is a belief in our heart, an inward possession. Coupled with that, there is an outward confession. These are things that are said and Demonstrate. Demonstrate it. Now notice, it is, confess with your mouth that Jesus is, what's the word? Lord. This is not Jesus' Savior. <laughs> is he the Savior? Sure. This is not confessing with your mouth that Jesus was a good guy, or a moral teacher, or a miracle worker. This is saying that Jesus is your Lord. You understand that? Okay. A lot of people who grow up in the church, and we as parents, if our children are, have drifted away, will say, well, they know the truth, and they may know the truth, 
but if they don't believe the truth, that knowledge is not doing them a whole lot of good. I'm just telling you the reality. Say, well, I believe that Jesus is the Savior. This isn't saying that you believe Jesus is the Savior. This is saying that he is your Lord, radically different. When you say he's your Lord, you are saying that I am following him. I am obeying him. I am living for him. When he asks me to do something, I'll do it. When he asks me to go somewhere, I'll go. I want to know him, but serve him. I'm putting my life under him and trusting his deliverance, his power, his help. I am living for him because he is my Lord. That's Christianity. American Christianity is, sprinkle a little Jesus on your life and it'll get a little bit better. Because Jesus lives to serve me versus I live to serve Jesus. Man, that hurts. It's the truth. Jesus is Lord. He's the greatest. He's the highest. He's the ultimate. He's the one in which I have given myself to. That's being a Christian. God, help us to follow you. Do we do it perfectly? No, but our heart bent is, he is my north star, he is my compass, he is the thing that is most valuable to me, and I am living for him. That's being a Christian. This is what Paul is saying. (laughs) Jesus himself said, if you love anything more than me, you're not worthy of me. Do you remember that? We don't like that Jesus. We like the little baby Jesus, the one that we can control. That we tell him where to go versus he tells us what to do. Yeah, I'm putting it on strong today because I love you. Remember that. This is what this passage is saying. Jesus is Lord means that he is your sovereign and your king, the one you're under, the one you've given yourself to, the one you love and obey and seek to honor. In order to be saved, you must have both possession, internal belief, and confession, external evidence, both root and fruit. You can't have one without the other. Because if you don't have both, then you don't have either. And you are not saved. Let me let that sink in. There's people who say that they believe, but there is little to no evidence of their belief fruit in their life. Now, there's people then who do good things, but they do it because they're humanitarian, right? They want peace in the world, they want people to get along, and they pick up trash, and they kiss babies, and they fund wells, and they do this type of stuff. They're doing it because they're uh, humanitarians versus Christians. You have to have belief coupled with expression. Okay, are you getting this? Scares me to death. We have people that say they believe, but they don't follow Christ as Lord, but they think they're going to heaven. Whoa. And other people who think that they're a good person because they're way better than Hitler, right? Why do we always compare ourselves to the worst person possible, right? But they don't believe in Jesus. They are, quote-unquote, good people, right? But they don't see Jesus as Lord or one, the only way. And there are millions of people, let's, billions of people, In these categories. For with your heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Heart belief, mouth confesses. Both are critical. You will not hear a gospel from this place as long as I am here. 
that does not couple both of these. That's the good news that everyone can be saved. Saved from what? The penalty of our sin. Our sin, we don't want to talk about sin, right? Because we're all good, right? Everybody's good, right? Or we're all victims. Yeah. We have a holy and righteous and loving and powerful God that when we disobey Him, we are trespassing. I have broken every commandment, right? Yeah. In my heart, certainly. I need what Jesus is I need to be made new, and he offers us this hope, the greatest hope in the world, the message of the gospel, to be renewed, transformed, forgiven of our sin, walking in right relationship with him, and endeavoring to walk in right relationship with other people. This is the good news of the gospel, and we carry the good news of the gospel. You and I have been given this. Last point, and we're going to go to communion. Okay. Paul continues, and this is the last point. We are sending and going. This is not optional. This isn't, well, I'm going to put some money into the plate to help other people go do that thing. It's not that. We are all sending and going. We send people to places that we can't go, and we go places that we can. Powered by the Spirit to fulfill his calling as an apostle, the Apostle Paul writing this, blazes the logic trail that will give us a path to follow and a place to participate. So he says what this is. This is the gospel. Those who believe in their heart that Jesus is Lord and confess with their mouth that God raised him from the dead will be saved. This is the gospel for everyone, everywhere. The people at that time, the Jewish people thought it was only for the Jews. The good news is it's for everyone. Anyone who calls on the name of the Lord, be it a Messiah tribes person, or your cranky boss. It's for everyone. That's good news. And then he goes on and says, okay, well, what about this? So how can they, how, how then will, verse 14, how then will they call on him whom they have not believed? So how can people, if the good news is that they can call on Christ to be saved, well, how can they call on him and how can they believe on him? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? They can't call on him if they haven't heard about him. And then how are they to hear without someone preaching, communicating the message to them? Good point. And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So here's the logic. The ultimate goal is for people to call on Jesus and believe in him and be saved. That's the ultimate goal. But people cannot call on him or believe in him if they have not heard about him. And they can't hear about him unless someone tells them about him. And people cannot tell them about Jesus if they're not sent to do so. So the message of the gospel is the greatest gift that can be given to anyone. For through it we have eternal life. That's why he says how beautiful it, it is the feet of those who bring us the message. Aren't you grateful for the person who communicated the gospel to you? Changed your life. Changed your eternity. Changed everything. Aren't you grateful to that person or persons who did so? How beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Now, the truth is not everyone who hears believes, but people cannot believe unless they hear. So messengers, which we are, 
If you're a Christian, you're a messenger. Messengers are responsible for delivering the message. And we are to be, be both going and sending. This isn't optional for those who proclaim Jesus as their Lord. We are going where we can and sending where we can't. The gospel is for us, but it's not about us. It's for the world. It's about God, and we get a part in it. This is the beautiful, good news, and this is the relationship and the message that we have to bring to the world. A messenger is not a good messenger if they never deliver the message. We as a church have a vision statement, a mission statement, and it is intentional. It's from the beginning of this book. I would love to be able to come up to you if you're part of Crosspoint. Hey, tell us what our vision statement is. Some of you know it. Some of you kind of know it. Some of you are like, we have a mission statement? It's on the wall out there, people. (laughs) It's on here. It's from the beginning of this book. We exist As a church, we receive grace and a calling to what? To bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. This is what we do. This is why we're here. This is why this building is here. That we would be obedient in faith because we love Jesus and we follow after him and we grow and we learn And we expand like a greenhouse. We've talked about this in the past. To bring about the obedience of faith. Beyond just knowledge, to belief, to following him. And we do this for the sake of his name. Where do we do this? Among all the nations. Missions is not on the periphery. It's the heart of the gospel. We're not a church with a missions program. We are a church on mission. Hear me. It's intentional. Why do you think we're still here 140 years later? One, because people prayed. Two, because they continued to believe the gospel. And three, because they looked to make a difference in the world. The mission of God is bigger than you. And you are getting an invitation to be a part of it. Starting in your world. So I'm going to pray for us, okay? And we're going to do communion, and we're going to renew our faith. We've talked how many weeks? 12, 13, 14 weeks about prayer, right? Talk about prayer. Why? Prayer is necessary so people would hear the gospel and be saved. Prayer is not just about our life being better, right? And all of your boo-boos getting fixed. Ultimately, it's about the gospel being presented. So I'm going to pray for us. And I want you to think about the own state of your heart. Right? You might be here today, and you're like, well, I'm here. You may not believe the gospel. You might know a lot about Jesus, but you've never put your faith in him for eternal life. Possession. Do you believe? You might have been dragged here by somebody. Do you believe? You believe. Your grandmother cannot stand in front of God to vouch for you. Or your mom, or your neighbor, or your spouse. You and God. Do you believe? Is Jesus your Lord? And if it is, he is your Lord, ask God for help to make your life reflect it and say, God, I'm following after you regardless. I'm going to do what you do. I'm going to say what you say. I'm going to go where you go. God, help me to do this. So let's pray. God, we're so grateful that you have given us an invitation to join in what you're doing throughout the world. 
I'm grateful for men and women who walk miles through the dust to know about this Jesus. That we're grateful that the gospel, this story of the goodness of God from creation is reached to us. Modern day America, 2022. We're grateful for the people who have communicated it to us. And God, we can't do anything without you. Can't. You're working in our hearts. Changing us, equipping us, confronting us, loving us. That's you. God, you're the only one that can change us from the inside out to give us the ability to do what we can't do because of our sin nature. You change us. God, I pray for perhaps someone here even today who is listening online who has never committed themselves to believe in Christ as their Lord. But I ask that they would make that choice today and couple it with communication of who you are and what you've done, change in their life, living for you. God, I ask for radical salvations. And God, will you help us as a church to do this in greater ways, to go to other places, to continue to support our friends that we've sent out. God, will you help us with our cranky neighbors, God, the people we don't even like. (laughs) Lord, will you give us love that is way beyond us. Help this place do what you've called us to do, to live courageously out of the belief that you are Lord. And so, Father, as we renew our commitment to you through communion, God, I ask that you would meet with us. Help us to think about these things seriously before we're standing in front of you on that day. God, I ask that every person who is committed and connected to this church, at least this church, would not face any shame on that day because you will say, by your grace, welcome, good and faithful servants. We love you and give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Jim's going to come up and lead us in communion. By the way, I failed to mention before, um, there was a, uh, there is a Crosspoint member who passed away last week. Uh, Ada Moore uh, went home to be with the Lord last week, and uh, her funeral is going to be this Friday, 1 o'clock here. Visitation's at 11 o'clock. Um, the funeral's at 1 o'clock. There'll be a lunch served afterwards for Ada Moore. If you have more questions about that, see me. The obituary is going to be printed uh, in the paper. So go ahead, Jim. Thank you. If you, uh, <clears throat> if you don't have the elements in front of you, just make sure you raise your hand and their ushers are ready to, to uh, give you those elements. We have one over here. Uh, Joel's going to go over that way, I think. Yep. I would like to invite you just to be quiet before the Lord for a minute. We have a lot to think about, don't we? Have we set apart Jesus as Lord? Is he the reigning, ruling, sovereign, God of our lives, yes or no. I think it was Josh McDowell who said, Jesus is either a a liar, a lunatic, or he is Lord. He said this in John's Gospel, chapter 10. 
the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said this about himself. I came that they, that you and I, may have life abundantly. And then he said these words, I am the good shepherd. Jesus said that. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Then we read in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup, after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. But then listen to these words. Listen carefully. Listen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim, you preach, you make it clear the Lord's death until he comes. We remember and we proclaim. Jesus, the good shepherd, has sent the Holy Spirit to live in us and empower us, empower us for life and ministry. The good shepherd went so far as to lay down his life for us, his sheep, so that we could share in his life, having life more abundant here and now, and eternal with him. When we celebrate this table, we remember all that he has done for us and provided for us, and we proclaim that he is indeed our good shepherd. We are his sheep, and in him we have found the one who loves us so much that he laid down his life for us. Would you join me, if you're ready, in partaking of the bread as we remember and proclaim the death of that great shepherd of the sheep. And would you join with me as we partake of the cup of his suffering? And in so doing, we remember and proclaim the benefits of his death on our behalf. As we go out from this place, in our going, we live for Christ, our shepherd and our Lord, sharing not only in his death, oh man, sharing not only in his death, not only participation, not only is it a participation in his death, but it is also a participation in his resurrection. And like our good shepherd, we live for others through the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit who is the promised one coming down from heaven just as our good shepherd promised. Amen. together to sing, can we? We believe. In this time of 
desperation But no we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe are struggling to believe in you, God. 
struggling to trust you, God, I pray that you'd help them, Lord. Make yourself known and real, God, to them. Lord, teach us to be humble and to walk with you, Lord. We need you, God. More than ever, Lord, we need you. We believe today, God. We declare that together. In the name of Jesus, Lord. Washing over me, washing over you. 